Hey, Linda. Hey, Lloyd. How are you? Doing okay. How about you? Pretty good. Did you get the books I sent you? I did. I did. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay, great. I, they're just for your, that library that you were starting. Yeah, I very much appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Um, it's, it's been pretty popular this semester. Um, yeah, they're just grabbing books off the shelf. and That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So I appreciate the, uh, replenishing <laughs> oh sure Hey, Monica. Hey. <laughs> How is everyone? I'm doing okay. Good. Waiting to hear what you have to tell us. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining. Uh-huh. Changing my name. I figured that was you, though. <laughs> <clears throat> So let's see, I am zooming from home today. So oh, I don't yeah. have my usual double monitor set up, but- um, Wow, you have a double monitor usually? Usually, yeah, <laughs> which is very nice. Ever since the pandemic uh, yeah. happened, yeah. we Because we typically have double monitors at the office and then they just lent us double monitor, like another monitor for our, our home setup. Nice. Um, but yeah, so I do have a slideshow and everything, but very it's very nice. Cool. I just made you co-host. So. Amazing. Okay. Thanks. Um, and do you have any objections to this workshop being recorded? No objections. No. Okay. I'll double check with everybody when, once we officially get started. But it is recording right now, so. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> How's it been? I know today's just the first day. Yeah. Uh, the first workshop went really well. Um, you know, uh, it was a uh, recycled art workshop. I was, uh -huh. I was wondering how that, that was going to go online, but it seemed to go pretty well. Mm, oh, cool. Had materials in their house. And oh, that's cool. Together. Yeah. So um, happy with it. And then there's another art workshop on animal drawing at three o'clock. That uh -huh. also sounds really interesting. So that's so cool. Is this the first year that we've done like art, art stuff? No, we've been doing art uh for oh gosh a few years six, okay cool six or seven years yeah that's like awesome that. oh that many wow yeah. yeah boy you know what they say about time flying yeah yes. <laughs> yeah um i get all confused because of the different variations that started out as writers weekend and then became mm -hmm. uh weekend of arts and now it's culturama yeah um, this is, this is yeah. the 15th year of the event <laughs> We started wow. in 2008, so yeah, that's crazy to think about. <laughs> um, and then tomorrow, all the online workshops are writing related. So mm -hmm. I, I was a... thinking about um, the contest that you had for a couple of years, mm -hmm. and I thought, hmm, well, I wonder, did we stop it because of going online? basically yeah mm. it was going to be it was going to be hard to manage um right and i still haven't quite figured out a way to, to manage it now that we're blending the two online and then in person right um once i can figure out the details of how that would work uh, i would like to bring it back 
Um, well, I have a couple ideas, so I'll email you. Oh, please do. Yeah, please do. Yeah. I have a okay. whole committee of people now. Now that John's gone, I have a whole committee of people to help me. Um, Yay. What it takes to replace John. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it is. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we're. Oh, you must really miss him. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy, him. I'm happy for him. I'm happy for him and Anne that they're doing really well. Oh, sure. Year. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely miss him. Definitely miss him. Do you think he's coming back? I would say no. <laughs> I, that's on. kind of the vibe I pick up as yeah. well. Something would have to go like terribly, terribly wrong. And I hope it doesn't. I really hope it doesn't. In the yeah. Last yeah. Month, um, in order for him to, I think, change his mind at this point. I, I can't, I, I can't see it happening. Well, I think he just really had burnout, you know, and just needed a complete change of pace. I think a lot of us do, um, but he's been looking for a change of pace for a really long time. So. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not that there's anything wrong with Mount Sack, but. Yeah. Oh, but, no, it's a wonderful place to work, but boy, especially yeah. these last years with the pandemic and switching yeah. back and forth from online to in class, and then suddenly someone's exposed and suddenly you're online again. It's crazy making. Right. And then there was also was uh, an opportunity to, and there, there are thing that, things that things that Anne wants to do too. That mm -hmm. yeah. of course, yeah. It's hard to explore those when you're tied to a single place. So right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's almost one o'clock. Wonder. Mm -hmm. Oh, exactly one o'clock. Oh, wait, maybe another minute. Okay. I just got a little note that says my uh, internet is unstable. So if I pop off or anything, it seems it seems fine. But sometimes on my like on my phone, it like disconnects or whatever. So hopefully on the computer, it's gonna be. Okay. I haven't noticed any stuttering on your video or your audio. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Great. I wish I could make the in-person one. Like I, I, I miss going back to campus, but I uh, just fell on a weekend where I'm like, oh, I have weddings to go to. Yeah, there's really, it happens. Yeah. Um, and there was no way I was gonna do, uh, do it during Thanksgiving weekend, so. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's never going to be like a perfect schedule where everybody can make it. So, yeah, nope. All right. Uh, so, let's uh, go ahead and officially get started. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Lloyd Aquino, the Cultural Robin Coordinator. I'd like to welcome you to uh, this workshop uh, with Monica Fernandez. Um, let me just say a couple quick words about Monica and we can uh, turn things over to her. Uh, Monica is a former Mount Sac student and a, a, a product of our creative writing program. Um, she was a member of the Creative Writing Club and one of the student editors for our literary magazine, Creepy Gnome, um, a great magazine um, that, was, that was around for a couple of years. Uh, she, then, she then moved on to uh, UC Irvine and City London University. Is that City that? University London. City University yeah. London. There we go. Um, and now she works in media for Red Hen Press. Um, so, Monica, go ahead. All right. Thank you so much, Lloyd. Um, yeah, I put together a little presentation um, just to keep my thoughts straight because I tend to ramble a lot. So, I am just going to share my screen. Um, let's do this whole thing. Right. Okay. Um, so uh, I put, I was really honored to be asked back to, um, to Culturama this year. It's been, uh, when I, when I was a student at Mount Sac, I really enjoyed being in the Creative Writing Club and going to what was then known as Writers Weekend. And then it turned into Culturama. And um, at the time when I was a student, I was I was very um, excited and kind of hoping to one day come back and be like a presenter or, you know, be on a panel or something like that. And um, so when I was asked to do that a couple of years ago, um, I was, it was like a dream come true. And so it's, it's been so great to be back um, year after year and lending my um, experience um, to hopefully guide others. Uh, so I, I tried to do something a little different this year. In the past, I've spoken about um, 
just publishing in general. Um, but now I think that I would love to talk a little bit more about specifically how to market you and your work um, as in terms of publicity. So um, I'm, let's see. Our agenda today, we have 90 minutes. So, and I'm gonna see if I can fight 90 minutes because I can talk about this for hours. Um, but the agenda today, I'm going to introduce myself and um, my experience and kind of what leads me to uh, be qualified, quote unquote, to kind of talk about this stuff. Um, I will talk a little bit about media and publicity and why it's important for all authors, whether you have a manuscript or a book, or if you're just starting out and you're kind of just not sure what to do and how to build your following. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the three key elements of publicity uh, as far as what I often tell our authors at Red Hen, um, which are long reach pitches or op-eds or essays, events, and social media. It's kind of like a triangle of things. And we usually tell our authors that they can, um, they can, you know, choose and excel at two of the three. They don't have to do all of them. Um, just as long as you kind of like feel comfortable and are, you know, excited about doing two of them. Uh, and then at the end of the, I'm hoping around like two o'clock, we can do a little bit of a mini campaign plan using everything that you learned um, during this presentation to kind of uh, apply it to you and your own work and see if you can come up with some fun ideas for that. Um, so I'm gonna continue. Um, brief introduction. Lloyd also already said some stuff, but um, my name is Monica Fernandez. I am the media director at Red Hen Press. Um, I've been working at Red Hen for about five years now. I started off as an intern in 2017 and I was able to move up um, through the ranks and, and finally to media director, which I was just promoted to earlier this year. Um, and so I'm very honored. Uh, for that title. Um, I got my master's degree in arts, so not an MFA, but just an MA, um, with in creative writing and publishing from City University of London. Um, and I've been kind of assisting uh, my time at Red Hen. I've focused on assisting um, our books and our authors kind of getting attention and uh, reviews and media things and getting our authors into festivals and stuff like that. So, um, that is primarily kind of the work that I do and I've been doing it for a little bit. So I've been able to navigate the publishing industry um, fairly well. And I have learned so much uh, from my time in the industry. And so hopefully I can impart some wisdom upon you all. Um, as I'm going through the rest of the presentation, feel free to raise your hand. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to kind of stop in the middle of the presentation. Uh, there's also going to be a little bit of a Q&A at the end if you have anything kind of more general, um, but there's kind of a lot of information to impart, and so I am happy to kind of just uh, clarify things as they come to you per each subject. Um, so what is media and publicity? Um, a lot of people think of it as like media marketing, um, in terms of Red Hen, our marketing department is actually a little bit different than our media department. So our marketing is more metadata and kind of behind the scenes stuff. So it's really focusing on increasing your visibility, um, mostly like for full books, published books um, in the online market and kind of in the general like bookstore and librarian market. Um, so that's our marketing uh, department and media and publicity is more of the front facing side of things. So um, social media and events um, are what I primarily do. Um, your, in terms of you and as authors and writers, um, media and publicity is really about your presence in the literary world. So while writing is a solitary act, sharing your work takes a village. It is, um, it takes a lot of people to try and get your work out there, to champion your work and to spread it far and wide. Um, publishers, in terms of if you have a full length uh, manuscript that you're ready to um, you know, publish traditionally, if you're looking into that avenue, 
Um, I, from a media perspective, look for active literary citizens. And what that means is I'm looking for people, um, for writers who have been involved in the literary scene, uh, whether it be through events, workshops, residencies, um, or uh, you know other publications, uh, just are you familiar with what's going on in, in the literary world? That makes it so much easier for us on the publishing side to be able to um, assist you in kind of marketing and the publicity of everything. Um, and it means that we don't really have to, like we do do this for many debut authors, but if you have the more knowledge you have, the less that we have to kind of uh, teach you along the way. Um, and so how familiar you are, familiar are you with the terminology and expectations of the literary world? And what networks have you cultivated in your career? So that just means, you know, what friends have you made in your MFA programs? If you're an educator, what other educators um, are your colleagues that could support you? Um, because when you, if and when you try and get traditionally published, publishers really lean on authors' networks um, to assist with their publicity. Um, in terms of my job, there's always, you know, a certain, I can take books to a certain point. I um, do a certain amount of things for every book, uh, but my reach can only go so far, and that's where an author's network comes into play, where their connections and, um, you know, and their friends and family come into play. So if the more of a network that you have, the easier it is to kind of spread the word about your work, you and your work. So as you're kind of working through that, as you're thinking about how this applies to you, even if you don't have a full length manuscript ready, think about how you can start putting smaller pieces out or participating in, um, in conferences, if you are, you know, a panelist in, in certain panels or anything, or participating in writing retreats or workshops, um, stuff like that, and just kind of making yourself known as a literary citizen. Um, do I hear a question? Nope. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, I cannot see that. What about reviewing books on Goodreads? This is yes. So. I would say reviewing books in general is a really great example of being involved in the literary scene. I think that if you were to review books, um, I would advise that you focus on getting your reviews published in, um, you know, in, in journals or magazines. So places like Lit Hub, um, like, other journal, oh, I don't remember which journals, I think the Tahoma Literary Review, the Chicago Review, the LA Review of Books, um, they publish kind of pre-written reviews. And so if you write a review and then you try and get it published in a, in a, you know, a print or an online magazine or journal, that's a little bit more of a better reach than Goodreads would be. So definitely advise kind of reviewing books is absolutely a, a great example of being a literary citizen. Um, and you can start getting your name out there by getting your reviews published in various places. Thank you for your question. Um, all right. So the elements of publicity, um, well, before I get to the elements of publicity, anybody else have any other questions about literary citizenship and kind of cultivating that network? Okay, great. Um, let me just, I don't remember. I put together a time and counted myself. I think I am being on time. Cool. Okay, so I said that the three, there are three elements that we, that I at uh, Red Hen always advise our authors to kind of think about as they're thinking about book publicity. And this also applies for anybody who doesn't have a full book. Um, so if I'm, I'm probably going to generalize it and like just talk about like your book, but if you don't have a book yet and you're just working on pieces, um, this totally applies to you as well. So just change that in your brain. Um, long reads pitches. So these are also known as articles, essays, op-eds, um, essentially stuff that, uh, that gets published in kind of literary places like Lit Hub, Electric Literature, um, the LA Times. 
New York Times, uh, Washington Post, places like this. So um, think about four to six topics that you're writing about. They can be about literally anything. If they're not, they don't have to be about your book or your work. They don't have to be about craft. Um, what I usually recommend is our authors is to think about what's circulating in the zeitgeist, um, in kind of what's happening in society and how can you add your voice to that existing conversation? Um, some examples that I can give are uh, during, during 2020 at the height of the pandemic, our authors, two of our authors got essays placed in uh, the LA Times and the New York Times. And both of them were about their lives during the pandemic. One was uh, a woman in the LA Times, she wrote about, um, growing up as a hypochondriac and living now during the pandemic as a hypochondriac while everybody else was kind of learning, you know, exact, essentially what she had been living with her entire life. Um, and this fit well with actually her book. She wrote a memoir um, about living, growing up with her father who was schizophrenic and how his madness almost took her, um, took her with him. And so she wrote a little bit about that. Um, and then the second essay was placed in the New York Times. It was about an author who, um, her family runs a truck stop and she noticed how everything else in the world was at a standstill during the pandemic, except for truck stops because truck stops, they needed to keep going. Um, that had nothing to do with her book. Her book actually was published by Red Hen uh, in, like years ago. And I think she had published a fiction, like a novel. Um, and so despite the fact that it had published a long time ago, um, it still helped to add additional publicity for her and her sales. Um, and the reason for this is because at the end of your essay, there's that little like one or two sentence bio of, of the author of the essay. And that's where you can plug in. Like this is, you know, blank. so-and-so is the author of this book that just came out with Red Hen Press in 2022. Um, and so if anybody reads those essays and they're like, huh, this person makes a good point, or I really liked the way that they wrote that, uh, they will see that in their bio and then look up um, essentially their, their books and see if they would like to read anything else that they've written. So Long read pitches are a really great tool for you to be able to lend your voice out into the world, talk a little bit about what you're comfortable with and, um, and showcase that you can talk about other things besides your book. Um, I did note at the end, well-written essays are more than opinion posts or rants. So this, you know, there's a difference between like an an essay and like a blog post. And uh, I won't name any names, but an author of ours submitted, we were, we were asking if they could write an essay for us. Um, and they submitted an essay, but it felt more like a rant. And it was, you know, it, there were opinions that were pretty aggressive, but they weren't really backed up with any uh, facts or any kind of balance or anything like that. So just take care when you're writing to be able to, you know, express your opinion, but express it in a way that um, allows healthy kind of debate um, or it's, you know, you're, you're kind of covered and backed up in what you're talking about. Um, another example I'll just give really quick about essays and pitches and stuff is um, one of our authors, Steve Almond, wrote an essay about pinball machines, and he collected pinball machines, apparently. Had nothing to do with his book, which was an essay collection about uh, his observances in the world and how, essentially, he saw coming. He, he understood why we ended up electing Trump as president. Um, but the pinball essay got picked up by Southwest Magazine and was published in, you know, Southwest is the magazine that's in the pockets of every Southwest flight. Um, and so it was in there. And I, I'm not sure how it translated into sales. I do know that book is one of our best-selling books, could be just about the topic. 
Um, but it could be because he was in Southwest Magazine. So shoot high um, and kind of think about all these topics that you would like to share and write about and uh, add your voice to. Um, does anyone have any questions to that? No, and I don't see anything in the chat. Okay. Well, welcome everybody who came in just a little bit ago. Um, happy to go back to anything. I feel like I'm going through my things a little bit quickly. So I just want to make sure that we have enough time. I think I'm, let's see. Actually, not bad. Um, in terms of long reads pitches, so they're called pitches because um, what you can do is you can think about the four to six topics and you can write a little bit of a mini description of what you think your essay will be. And that is what constitutes your pitch. So we usually advise our authors not to write the entire essay just yet, because when you pitch your ideas, if someone takes it up, like if LitHub accepts your essay, uh, they will have specific parameters. Like uh, it has to be, 600 words, or uh, we like this idea, focus on this instead, or something like that. And that way you can kind of tailor your essay to their specifications and you don't have to uh, try and figure out like how to cut all of your things and restructure um, if you've already written it. So the pitches are just kind of essay summaries of what you think, where you can go with it. Um, and then that. Uh, we at Red Hen have a list of places with pitch submission like links, like to the LA Times and to the New York Times and stuff like that. So um, submission guidelines for that stuff is usually found um, just on the website of literary websites like LitHub, Electric Literature. I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to keep referring to those too because they're just off the top of my head, the ones that I know um, accept kind of pre-written essays like that. Um, all right. So the second prong or corner of the triangle in publicity and media are events. Um, be involved in as many events as you can, even if you don't have a book yet, if you are just um, working on writing, um, if you have short pieces or anything, just be involved as in, in as many events as you can. Um, at Red Hen, we always encourage our authors to plan their book tours themselves. Um, the reason for this is kind of twofold. One is because if I work on, yeah, anywhere between 25 and 45 authors at any given time, um, planning individual book tours for every single one of them is absolutely not possible. Uh, there is a lot of back and forth coordinating with schedules, you know, travel um, requirements, the ability to travel in certain places. Um, and so it's just so much easier to cut out the middleman, which would be me, and have the author connect with the bookstore themselves. Um, the second reason for that is the author is then able to build a relationship with that bookstore personally. And so if their book, if their next book isn't with Red Hen, but they would like to have another event at this bookstore that they had a, an event at before, um, that bookstore will remember that author. And they will be able to kind of form that relationship and build on it um, throughout the entirety of their career. So um, that's, you know, the main reasons why of what we give, why we need our authors to kind of book their events themselves. Um, we need events to be memorable. So just reading not doesn't really cut it anymore. Um, especially now, I've actually noticed after the pandemic, now that um, now that in-person events are returning to bookstores, lots of bookstores are being a lot pickier as to which events they're accepting. Um, and the reason is because it's it takes a lot of work to to put on an event. Um, the publicity of everything, the organization, um, you know, ordering the books and then obviously working the events. Um, and so the bookstores have often, I feel like now during the pandemic, they are trying to pick the events that they think are going to get the most people into their store. Uh, and that means it needs to be an exciting event. 
we usually recommend, you know, adding conversation partners are huge and a very easy way to get your events kind of very interesting. Um, so thinking about what events you can create with the people around you um, and what you can talk about at those events. So in the past, we have often recommended, you know, actually at Red Hen, we connect our authors with each other. And we, we do this big publicity Zoom every twice a year, actually, with our um, authors from sandwich seasons. So we work in spring season and fall season. So in January, we're going to have a meeting with our spring 2023 um, and our fall 2023 authors. And they're all gonna meet each other. We're gonna kind of go over publicity and what they can be doing. And then in June, July, we will have a meeting with our fall 23 and our spring 24 authors. So the fall, essentially the fall 23 authors get a meeting with spring 23 and spring 24. And so they're sandwiched in between um, because we usually focus on having authors kind of have a long tail of publicity with their book. And having each of the Red Hen authors know each other, connect with each other, gives them the ability to uh, capitalize on the locations of other authors. So for example, we have one author, a poet who lives in Seattle, that's coming out with a book in 2023. Uh, we have another poet that lives in Connecticut, who's also coming out with a poetry book in 2023, and we can connect them. And the Seattle poet can go over to uh, Connecticut and get events there with that Connecticut author because it's easier for a local author to get events um, in their local area. And then the Connecticut author can go over to Seattle and get events there with that Seattle author. Um, and so it's usually just using all of the connections that you've built, figuring out where you can go um, and what you can do. So I usually, in terms of programming events for me and Red Hen, like to focus on books that have similar themes or authors that have similar um, kind of backgrounds or things that they can talk about or discuss. Uh, that just makes it for a much easier conversation and a much more interesting one. Um, so we had recently done an event at Romans, and I see your question in the chat, I'll get to that right now. Um, we had an event at Romans with two prose authors and their books were pretty different, um, but they both had in common, it was their first novel that they ever wrote. They're both local authors in LA. They both talked a little bit about toxic masculinity in their books. And so even though the plot lines were very different, there was still a lot of stuff they could talk about. Um, and it actually made for a really interesting conversation. What is a conversation partner? It's pretty much another person, author usually, um, who can help to talk with you, essentially. So it's just someone, they can either moderate a conversation, which means that they would essentially interview you just in front of the audience, or it can be someone that has kind of a, a what's it called, a, an equal billing on the event thing, which means that they would share the events kind of equally with you. And so they would read the same amount and you would they would ask each other questions. Um, and so it would be kind of like a good balance. Um, or there could be two authors, um, and then there could be one moderator uh, who would facilitate with asking questions of both of them and or of each of them. So it's really just a matter of making sure that the event is an event and it's not just a reading. Um, so as you're thinking about trying to put together, either put together events or be involved in events or anything like that, Think about what you can talk about, what you would like to share, how you think you can make it an exciting, interesting event. Um, if I see, you know, if I read an event description and it's talking about like what's going on, I don't know, even if you match it with some kind of uh, popular culture thing, like how my book coincides with Stranger Things or whatever. Like if it's an interesting thing, it will get people in even if they've never heard of this author before. So, um, and this kind of goes for anybody that's planning uh, larger kind of open mic readings or kind of 
uh, featured readings or something like that with a lot of people um, getting people in the door, like what kind of event would you be excited to go to essentially is, is, is what I'm trying to get at. Um, and that can also mean um, adding in other elements. So one of our one of our recently released authors, Pete Sue, has been making great circuit around LA with events and um, and has staged several events with actually a musician. Um, and we actually had a recent event uh, reading in conversation with Juan Felipe Herrera, uh, where he brought some musicians in to accompany him as he was reading. Um, that makes for a really cool and memorable event. And one of our authors, when she published her um, nonfiction book, Eat Less Water, which is about water sustainability in our cooking, um, she has a whole chapter on tequila and she brought tequila for a tequila tasting during her event. And so obviously one of the most memorable things ever. Um, so just think about making an event. Um, and then this I didn't put on the slide, but also as you're planning events and kind of booking them with bookstores or other venues, always be sure to be, this is gonna sound obvious, but always be sure to just be nice. Um, to be nice to the bookstore, be grateful, to be gracious, um, and to just be a great author because the reputation that you form with them is going to extend past your events. And the event is going to, you know, a lot of authors are concerned if you're selling books or whatever, are concerned with how many books you sell at the event or how many people are at the event itself, which is important. But what's also important is the kind of ripples that, um, that generate after the event. So if you are a great author, great host, um, and you make a great impression on the bookseller, then they will hand sell your book um, to people who come by the store. So even after you're not there, that book will still be on display for a little while and they can be like, oh yeah, we just had an event with this person. They were awesome. Um, so just making sure that you kind of make a great impression on everybody that's involved with putting together your event because um, I've seen authors burn bridges before and I would not advise it, obviously. Um, it's very unfortunate when authors, you know, either put blame on bookstores for uh, low attended events or, you know, mistakes that happen or anything like that. And they burn those bridges. You know, it, it affects the relationship with, um, with the bookstore for, you know, selling feature books. Um, so definitely just be nice uh, and plan a cool event. Um, that's definitely something that I would, I, I, there have been many events that I wish I could have attended and, um, because they've been so cool, but I just haven't been able to, and it makes me so sad. Um, so yeah, any questions on that so far? Okay. Oh, yeah. great. What about events at libraries or other places? Fantastic question. Yes, libraries are also a fantastic place to plan events. Um, oftentimes libraries also have like these meeting rooms or event rooms where you can have it there um, and then you build and establish that relationship with your library. Um, you definitely, I would absolutely advise people kind of looking into their library, um, making sure that the librarians know you, especially if you have a new book coming out because if they know you, then they'll be more than likely to support you and order your book um, and have it there. So libraries are a fantastic place. Other places that are not necessarily bookstores, also a great place. So if it's like, a, you know, we've had events at bars before, um, literary centers, uh, art museums. Uh, so any place that kind of might have some space for an event. Um, would definitely be a cool place. The only thing I would advise about events like that is um, if it's not a bookstore, typically the author would then have to sell your books yourself. So you would bring your books and then you would have to set up like a, we use Square, but any kind of card reading system uh, like Venmo also, a lot of our authors sell through Venmo. 
Um, so that just means that you are, you know, if you want to sell books, that's how you would take the payments is that you would sell them yourself. Um, at bookstores, the bookstore would then order your book and they would sell it through their channels. Uh, and so you wouldn't really have to worry about that too much. There are some bookstores that operate on what we call consignment, which means that you bring the books, um, they sell it through their registers, and then they give you a cut back of the sale and they take a little bit of it. Um, standard percentages, I believe, are 60% to the author um, and 40% to the bookstore, but it could vary. Sometimes it's 70, 30, uh, but it's usually in, in favor of the author. So if you don't mind doing that, that's also advisable. Um, and another thing I can kind of note are what we call book scan numbers. So if you're concerned with that, book scan numbers are essentially the numbers that um, are logged every time your barcode is scanned through like a, an official retail place. And that kind of is calculated um, and is like an official record of how many books you sell. And that helps with kind of getting you on rankings of like best selling lists and stuff like that. Um, so if you're super concerned with that, then bookstores are usually the best way to go. But if you don't care, um, then booking events at any other place um, is totally fine. What, if, what about if you're not good about planning events? Great question. Um, I would become friends with someone who is. <laughs> no, I would probably, um, I think if you, if you can't latch on to like, like if you're an introvert and you can't latch on to an extrovert or something like that, then um, just think about the kinds of events that you would like to go to. You know, the, the ones that you think are cool, just like how we are as writers. If you see a gap in the market and you're like, why isn't anybody doing something like this? You can be the one to do it. Um, and then you can be the one that, uh, you know, is known for pioneering that, which is going to be cool. Um, yeah, that's another thing. Um, I don't know if I forgot to put this into the into the slideshow, um, but I do have examples of pitches for events. So um, I can email it to anybody if they're interested. My contact information will be at the end of the slideshow. But um, essentially, it is. Uh, when you're booking events to bookstores, it's pretty much like a cold email, um, especially if this is your first book or if it's your first kind of like event idea or anything, uh, you essentially have to pitch yourself and, and your idea. And there is not really a specific formula, but it's very advisable to keep it short. Um, but introduce yourself and your idea kind of immediately and explain why you think it's a great idea for the specific venue. Um, bookstores, just like publishers, just like jobs, can tell when you send a form letter. Um, and so you really need to personalize every email that you send out and make clear that you gave it some thought and that you really do think that this is a great place for this particular event. And these are the reasons why. Uh, because if you're excited about having a, an event at that place, they will be excited about having you. Um, and so I think I forgot, yeah, I forgot to put that, plug that in for you, but I can definitely send that out um, to anybody who's interested. Um, but yeah, so there is a little bit of a magic in there. And I'll, I'll probably see at the end of this presentation, you'll have a chance to write one. So I think I'll try and find something um, before we leave so that you can emulate that example. Um, but yeah, any other questions about events? Okay, the last stop is social media. So obviously um, an important and unfortunately important part about book publicity. Um, a lot of our authors don't like social media and I totally get it. Um, so I always advise authors to choose what you're comfortable with. You don't have to be on every single platform, especially Twitter at this point. I know it's blowing up. So you, we don't know what's going on with that. Um, so don't even think about like, you don't have to, if you're not already on Twitter, I don't think you have to be right at this point, but 
um, social media is a pretty great place to be accessible to your readers. And especially if you're trying to reach younger readers or any other kind of reader who's, who has internet access, they will look you up. They will want to look you up and learn more about you. And so that's why social media is a great way for you to stay in touch with people and to offer readers a perspective into your life that they want to get, because that is, that is what social media is. It's a, it's a little window into your life, um, what you choose to share, obviously. And it is a way for the readers to connect with authors in a way that they can't, you know, just reading the book. So I advise our authors to choose what you're comfortable with and have fun. If it's not, if social media is not your thing, again, as I said, you can focus instead on the long reads and events and you can just do away with social media. We do advise everybody have a website though. You, that is a pretty crucial thing for any author. You must have a website at least to list you know, information about you, your book and your events. Um, if you were to dabble in social media, your content should be, we have like a thirds rule. So we think it should be about a third book or work related, kind of sharing what you are working on, what is coming up with you. A third events or community building related. So, um, you know, events that you have coming up, events that you've attended um, or events that you want to attend and are excited about that are, um, they don't necessarily involve you, but you are saying like, this looks super cool, I can't wait to go. Um, and then a third, personal, to the extent that you're comfortable with, of course. Um, so you don't have to, you know, share photos of your kids or your family. You don't even have to share photos of yourself if you don't want to. Um, but photos of, you know, just kind of behind the scenes stuff, thoughts, you know, um, and I have actually some examples that I would like to share with you. So social media examples from Red Hen authors. Um, let me see if this will work. I think this does. So Amy Liu, fantastic. Um, that should hopefully go away. Fantastic author with a great social media presence. So as you can see, she doesn't have many pictures of herself on her Instagram. She does a lot of nature photographs, actually. She hadn't been on Instagram before we took her book. And so she got on Instagram and then she kind of fell in love with this particular way of sharing herself. She takes photos and it's just of random things. And she's become a really beautiful photographer actually. Um, and so it could be as simple as that. And you can see she's sharing things that she's seeing about the writing community. And she's sharing stuff about her, what she's working on right now. Um, this, these are kind of historical photos featuring her family. She's working on, I believe, like a historical memoir about her family. Um, so, this is a fantastic exa example of what you can share without fully sharing too much of yourself. Um, I had her on Instagram and Facebook because what's cool is that you can connect these two and you can post the same thing on both. So social media, it's pretty much about being around and being active on these different places. If you're going to choose a platform, if you wanted to choose um, Instagram, you can also do Facebook because you can link them. And essentially, you don't really even have to do anything on Facebook because if you post things on Instagram, it'll pop up on Facebook. Um, it looks like Amy is also using her Facebook to promote additional things that she's working on. So things that aren't on her um, that aren't on her Instagram, but are only on her Facebook. So there are things like articles, um, links to things. This was cute that she found and she just reposted. Um, so kind of just like being around and active. Um, another fantastic example is Kim Stafford, who is a fantastic poet. And I love what he's done with this. You can see right off the bat, there is a formula for his 
um, social media account for his Instagram. It is alternating poem and image, poem and image without fail. And it makes a beautiful grid. So you can scroll down and you see there is a method that he was working on. And it works, especially for someone like Kim Stafford, who is, you know, a poet that doesn't like to share too much about himself, um, that doesn't seem to want to take photos of himself or of his family, but wants to share amazing photography that he's seen elsewhere. Um, this is actually, it looks like I'm in the process of sorting my 50 year career into an archive. So he is working on, you know, what this is what he's working on right now. So it's a behind the scenes glimpse and then it's sharing his own work, which is also fantastic. Um, another example is Kristen Miaris Young. She is the fantastic example of the thirds rule, which is one third book stuff, one third event stuff, one third personal stuff. She does a ton of sharing events that she's doing. She has shared essays that she's either written or has read. Um, she shares important stuff like voting um, and just other random things. This is a, an interesting video that she just posted the kid, about the kids getting her up before dawn. Um, she posts personal things about what she's working on and writing. So she's currently writing, this is probably her view. Yeah, this is her view from her retreat, day three of this retreat, working on my stamina. Um, so she's a fantastic example of kind of how to share what you wanna share. You know, if you wanna share more of yourself, she shares a lot of things about um, the events that she's going on, the people that she's met, how grateful she is to be a part of everything. She posted this on her anniversary of her wedding, which is beautiful. Um, so she's really great about sharing as much about herself as she can while still keeping it, you know, like making sure that the focus is also on both publicity and just publicity in general. She's also a journalist. She's worked her way through. So this also is where actually the whole question about reviews comes from. Uh, Kristen, 18 months before her book came out, came out to Red Hen Press to talk about publicity and she had a plan. And her plan was to review a ton of books uh, and get known for spreading the word and spreading you know, the, um, the knowledge about all of these books and making those connections, both with all of the places that she wrote reviews for and all of the authors that she wrote reviews for. And so she cultivated this entire network just by reading and reviewing books. Um, so that's a, you know, she's a great example of doing that. Um, and then the last example of social media, Kai Emmons, um, is an author, is a Red Hen author, and she has recently been diagnosed with ALS. Um, as many of you know, ALS is an unfortunately fatal disease with no cure. Um, so she has been talking a lot about her process, her thoughts, her exploration of this disease and, and what it's doing to her. And, um, and she writes a weekly blog post um, and people read it, lots of people read it. So she has on her website um, a blog, but she also posts this, I believe on Medium. I think she has a blog on Medium that is also reposted. Um, but this is how she keeps up with her kind of following. She writes essays about herself. She posts them on a weekly blog and, um, and she shares those essays on her social media accounts. So she's like, the new essay is up, please read it. Um, so this is also a great example of staying in touch with your readers, lending yourself and your personal thoughts out there to those who it might connect with. Um, and your blog is where you can write about anything. So this can be kind of where you can rant. It's just a blog. If you're publishing something, you know, for an, with an essay for another publication, that's where you gotta be a little more careful. Uh, but your blog is your blog and you can do whatever you want with it. So um, that is another kind of area where you can expand on and explore uh, sharing yourself and, um, you know, becoming more visible to 
readers who enjoy your work and who want to learn more about you. Um, all right. Okay. So I think we're now at the, uh, I feel like I bother people with marketing stuff that doesn't feel authentic or posting work that hasn't been published slash working on for future publication. What's a good way to get around that? Um, so bothering with, you know, bothering people with marketing stuff. So I think that the answer is in your question. Um, stuff that doesn't feel authentic is obviously not authentic. Um, and so if you're not, if you're just trying to market just to market, I think that people will know that. Um, I think that what you should focus on instead as you're thinking about all of this and kind of how you're trying to market yourself and your work and get yourself out there, don't think about it as marketing yourself. Think about it as you're sharing yourself, you're sharing your work, you're sharing, um, you know, you're excited to connect with people that way. And so if you come at it from that direction, I think it'll feel less markety and promotionally and more like, you know, I am happy to share my stuff with this stuff with you. I hope that you enjoy it. Um, yeah, and kind of just focusing on it that way. And if you're posting work that hasn't been published or if you're working on it, you know, that is also just kind of like a sample of your stuff. So you can just be like, here's a sneak preview of what I'm working on. Um, if you welcome people into the conversation, that could also help. Um, because if you if you feel like you're just marketing yourself or you're just spitting out information, people will kind of take that as that. They will start to ignore it. They'll put blinders on. If you start welcoming people into the conversation and giving them an opportunity to talk to you about it, I think that'll help with that feeling of inauthent inauthenticity. Um, and you know, help it feel a little bit more genuine that you are trying to promote yourself and your work, but you're also not trying to be, you know, a little, um, you're not trying to be annoying with it. You just want to like share it. And if you want to open up a conversation with people, that will be amazing. Um, and so that is kind of what you're hoping to do. And I think that that's, if you focus on that, then that will, uh, that will definitely make itself known. How can I feel more comfortable sharing? It's not something that nat comes naturally about work, my work. That is also a fantastic question. I think that as writers, we're always really scared about sharing our work, um, sharing parts of ourselves that we write in you know, the privacy of our, our solitariness. Um, I think, you can look at it from a perspective of you're trying to connect with people. And if this stuff is vulnerable to you, you can admit that, you know, this is, I'm scared to release this work. Um, but I want to, I, I hopefully will be touching someone by doing this. Um, or just thinking about it in kind of that way that's, you're not trying to be a salesperson or, you know, sell books or sell a, a brand of yourself. You're just trying to share what you're writing. Um, if you don't want, if you feel like you're not at a place to do that just yet, that might take, you know, a little bit more workshopping time or time with your writing group to feel confident in, in your pieces and in your writing. Um, but at some point, you know, just like all artists, we have to understand that there is a certain point where we just gotta let it go and spread it and share it with the world. And sometimes it's never gonna feel finished with us. Um, but if there is someone out there, like this will get easier if it's published work um, or if it's like a poem that was just recently published or something, um, there's that validation that comes with having that, you know, with having that happen to you and so that can just be like an exciting thing if you're sharing that. Um, but if you're still, you know, if you're sharing unpublished work and you're still just trying to get out there, um, if you if it helps, maybe you can start thinking about publishing other um, 
like essays or something like that. And then along with you sharing the essay that you got published, you can be like, I just also worked on this. So maybe give this a read or something. You can pair it with something else. Um, but yeah, I think that that is, it's definitely a hurdle that I think we all have to get over. Is reading published work a good idea? Yes, fantastic idea. Then you can also um, share where it got published and then that helps to promote that you know, journal or magazine or anything like that. Or people will also get impressed with that. And will be like, you can share, um, this just got published in the Tahoma Literary Review or, um, and I'm very excited about that. So please check them out or you know, something like that. And uh, people will be like, oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, so I definitely recommend sharing and reading published work. That's a fantastic idea. Absolutely. Um, okay, we are pretty great on time. So I think right now, here's where the publicity campaign comes in. Um, can everyone see everything? I know that sometimes if I share my screen on a single screen, there's like a little box or something that blocks something. Can you see the whole, the whole thing? No, so this is... Can you see it now? Uh, okay, cool, great. Um, okay, so this is where the mini publicity campaign comes in. Um, this is actually a project that I kind of give to my interns actually before I uh, start working with them is I just wanna see their ideas on how they can share work. Um, so I hope that everything that you've learned so far um, will help you to kind of apply, like apply this to yourself and your work. Um, so we're gonna do a small activity for each of the three elements. Uh, the first one for long reach pitches, come up with three topics you can write an essay about. They can literally just be the subjects. You don't have to write the full pitches. Um, and then if you want, uh, I, would, I will open the floor for people to share their mini campaigns and if you want to tell us a little bit more about what you want to write, um, that would be amazing. Um, for events, writing a mini pitch to a bookstore, asking to set up an event. Um, I think what I'll do after I explain all of this is I will um, probably stop sharing my screen and I will try and find a pitch for an event that I sent out so that I can show that um, and you can use that to emulate um, your pitch. But there's also, you know, describe you and your work and what you envision the event to be. So just a kind of short paragraph about that. And then social media, any fun ideas, campaigns, anything that you like. So this is, think about this in relation to either a piece of work that you just wrote um, or a piece of work that was recently published or a full length book that you are trying to get published. Um, and by social media campaign ideas, what I mean is, is there anything fun that you want to do, like in relation to this piece of work that you've put together? Or, you know, is there like a, do you want to do like an Instagram takeover? Do you want to create like a Spotify playlist of songs that will go with the work? Uh, do you want to put together a book trailer? Because that's been done before. Um, so this is kind of more about like an idea around a central piece of work that you want to pu publicize and bring attention to. Um, so I think, let's see. Does anybody have any questions about all of that? Instead of writing essays, can I write and submit short works of fiction? Yes, there are specific places that, um, that accept kind of short works of fiction, definitely smaller journals and stuff. Andrew, don't you run a journal that does that? Yes. Um, yeah, Andrew Turner runs a journal that, that does that, um, that accepts smaller works of fiction. Um, I think, isn't there a, Lloyd, I think you're off camera, but uh, isn't there a Matt Tack student magazine? Do they accept non-student submissions? Oh yeah, yeah, they accept everything. From awesome. everyone. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, literary journals and magazines, fantastic place to start submitting short works of fiction if you have kind of a repertoire of all of that. Um, uh, yeah. So, and if you don't know where to submit things to, 
my biggest resource and tool is um, poetsandwriters.com. So actually Poets and Writers, it's pw.org. Um, yeah, Poets and Writers is a fantastic research of anything that you ever wanna know in any stage of being a writer. So if you're looking for literary magazines to submit to, it has a whole list of that. If you're looking for publishers to submit to, it has a list of that. If you're looking for agents, if you want to get a literary agent, it has an entire list of literary agents. It has a calendar for events. It even has like a whole database of writing groups. Um, yeah, Duotrope, also a fantastic resource for literary magazines. So that's also a wonderful resource to use um, when you're trying to get your work out there. So that's a great question. Um, okay, in terms of the activity, does anybody have any questions about the activity? Um, I think what I will do is I'll, I will set a timer for 10 minutes uh, and people can start kind of generating and writing whatever they like. And then at 2.10, we will come back and uh, share whatever we're comfortable sharing. Um, and then from there, we can have a, you know, time for a little bit of a short Q&A for the rest of the time. Um, but until then, does anyone have any other questions? No? Okay. So what I'm going to do, I had planned on keeping this slide up for everybody, but uh, because I do want to find that events pitch for you all, I will um, uh, stop sharing my screen for just a little bit. Um, I will find something and then I'll just plug it into my, uh, to my slideshow and then uh, pull it back up for you all. So um, I think let's just get started. So you are all free to turn off your cameras if you want to work on things. Um, but I will set a timer now for 10 minutes. And then I will see you guys back in 10 minutes. And if you have any questions in the meantime, happy to kind of talk over it, but I'll let you guys kind of work for now.
we've got about four minutes left, but I just wanted to let you all know I set up uh, this is a pitch that I sent to a, um, a bookstore in, I believe it was North or South Carolina, I can't remember, um, but an author of ours asked if I could help to secure a, an event for her at this bookstore. So this is the email that I sent. Um, some key elements from there are um, acknowledgement of a previous event that we had with them, um, and then kind of a very clear uh, statement as to why I'm reaching out for this to this particular person in specifically. Um, a little bit about uh, the imprint and the book and the author and then topics of potential discussion, which I had uh, highlighted here for you. Um, so making very clear to the bookstore what this event could actually be about and kind of also giving them a little bit of a choice. Um, and then also providing a little bit of context as to the author's connection to this particular bookstore. So this particular author actually lives in Alaska, uh, but she has connections in, so I think it's South Carolina. Um, and so making clear to the bookstores, uh, their, the author's connection uh, will make, make it very easy, much easier for the bookstore con to consider. Um, you and your 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 work uh, for potential uh, acquisition for that event. Um, obviously, it's a little bit of a long one, and I have another example of an email that I sent out between publicists um, as we were trying to actually put together an event that we could then pitch a bookstore, uh, which I can show you later. But uh, wanted to just put this up for you to use an example as an example for the rest of your time. You don't have to write a full pitch right now, but you can probably think about, you know, a brief pitch of what you want to write. And then obviously I can send you this whole um, slideshow when you, uh, after today. You have about a minute and a half. Right, it is about 2.10. Do people feel like they're okay or do they want a little bit more time? Okay, I don't see any objections. So I'm going to just go to the next slide which just says time to share. Um, so does anybody want to share what they came up with? if they're excited about anything in particular or if they want feedback or anything like that. Yes, Andrew. Uh, they're not very good, so I'll start with that. <laughs> That's Because totally I have no fine. idea what I'm doing. It's very good. <laughs> I have no quick. idea. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't come up with anything lengthy because I just don't know what I'm doing mm -hmm. for this part, but like for pitches, I was like, maybe I could write about gaming because mm. I, yeah. I game. I don't know if that counts as anything or what I would even write about. I'm like, mm -hmm. uh, what would I write about? Like everything's already been said. 
Well, do you do you game like is it um, online games or is it like D and D or? Yeah, it'd be just like video games, mm-hmm. board games, stuff like that. Okay, yeah. I mean, that is an, a market in itself. And what's cool about that is you can whatever you choose to write about. Um, there are gaming magazines that you can kind of put that essay in. Uh, and then, you know, they can also get to know you both as a gamer and as like an, a poet, a writer. Um, so, yeah, I think that's an excellent idea, actually. Another thing that I, I don't know what this is with this, but like writing about stupid things that make me happy. <laughs> I think that's a feel good piece that would go anywhere, honestly. Um, yeah, so that that's also a fun thing. I think that a lot of places are also looking for positivity. So, OK. And then like the other thing is like sucky work environments, which I think everybody, everybody mm. knows about. Yeah, that's a great one. <laughs> um, so I didn't like, I didn't come up with any because I don't, I don't know like how to come up with a pitch thing. So yeah. um, you said that you have like stuff to send. So maybe that would be helpful later yeah. on to look at um, an event. It's like, what kind of things do you want to do? I'm like, I don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> so like <laughs> the events I was thinking is like, okay, the only thing that would sound remotely interesting would be a pajama party. That sounds amazing. I think that that would be so, I don't even think that any, I cannot think of any bookstore that has done a pajama party. So I think that that would be so much fun, especially for book people. I was like, yeah, like we don't want to go outside. Like let's have a pajama party. <laughs> um, and then for social media, it's like, you know, posting, like posting a reading, like me reading a poem or something. Mm-hmm. And then I have a, like a friend who does body paint so maybe collab with them where he does the body paint and then I like it's just my audio or something over it so that that was just the thought yeah that's so cool doing multimedia stuff like that is also super encouraged I know that TikTok is a thing um I don't I am not on TikTok I cannot do TikTok uh I know a lot of our authors are also like I can't do TikTok uh I love it I love it it's, I never <laughs> post, but I love it. That's amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, we're trying to get on TikTok, but it's it's a it's a job. Um, but yeah, no, those all sound incredible, very unique, and very unique to you. Um, and I think okay. that they would do very well. I think that you have hit a lot of things, like gaps in the market um, of people not doing things that you're thinking of. So I think that you would be able to find a great kind of niche in there. Um, okay okay now I don't now I don't feel so stupid (laughs) you definitely not no these are all incredible so the the most important thing about publicity really is just finding something that's authentic to you authentic and you know personal to you and unique um and these are all very Andy Turner and I love it um (laughs) and it's you know I'm very excited like that pajama party I think is gonna if you ever feel like you want to do that I would go to that for sure. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for sharing. And I, I will extend this to anybody as well. Um, you know, during the holidays is a little bit of a slow time for publishing. So I have some time to spare if anybody wants to schedule like a one-on-one chat with me. Um, I'm absolutely happy to kind of help coach you through some of these things or provide feedback. Um, if you wrote something and you're like, I don't know if this is good. Um, happy to kind of help in any way in that in that vein. So Andrew, we can totally work on um, pitches if you want. Um, yeah, and stuff like that. So thank you. Um, anyone else want to share? Yeah, Linda. Hello. Hi. Um, so my first book came out in October. And I did some work with a publicist. Thank you. Yeah, pretty exciting. A book I worked on for eight years. Mm. And um, anyway, so she and I worked together on some pitches Mm -hmm. and she sent them out. And, uh, you know, because she's the one who has the contacts. And one of the things I learned about publicists is that they don't share their contacts. (laughs) They want you to hire them to get the contacts. Yeah. Um. So anyway, and so I had a few nibbles, Mm -hmm. um, very small time for the most part, I think. Um, And um, 
I wrote a piece that was published on a, a someone uh, someone's site on recovering from betrayal because betrayal is one of the themes mm -hmm. in my book. And um, just an interesting little aside is that my my book is about a, an interracial love affair that took place in the early 70s. And so um, I wanted to write some thoughts that I had on just the topic of race. Mm -hmm. And she was totally against it. She said the ethos in publishing right now um, is that white people shouldn't write about race, racial issues. Mm. And um, I knew where she was coming from, but I still felt like I had some things to say. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, and sort of a rationale for how to talk about racial issues. And so she had me post it on Medium. Mm. And um, I'm not that familiar with Medium yet. That was my first time. Um, mm -hmm. But I think maybe I'll do more things there. Um, but anyway, in, in, in terms of, you know, so already I have quite a few topics that she and I uh, came up with. Um, but then looking, thinking about the bookstore pitch, like I, I went to three of my local indie bookstores and they were all totally underwhelmed by the idea of my book and me, mm. which was kind of shocking and disappointing. Um, but of course I wasn't doing what you said in this workshop, which is to, you know, suggest something different. Mm -hmm. And so uh, because of the era that my, that my uh, story takes place in, really the only idea that I had was to have a dress like the 60s and 70s mm -hmm. type of event. Mm -hmm. um, how to carry that off, I, I really have no idea. But um, I, if, if I may, I can also suggest um, music. Uh, so well, I music is a music is a actually a big theme in mm -hmm. my book. My book is called Our Song. Oh, um, because this well, was a long distance love affair, and one of the things that we did was write song lyrics to each other. Oh my god! And listen to the songs. That's but gorgeous. how to turn that into event? I I don't really know. I think that what you can do. So there are, if uh, I mean obviously this might. It, if you have any musician friends or if you know any musicians that could do it for free, um, having like a jazz band maybe like, and, and I have contacts actually with some jazz musicians. Um, we've had jazz events at Red Hen. So if you mm -hmm. wanted kind of like live music, that would be cool. Or you could just have- But, kind but of like where would you do this? Where would this be taking place? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that, there are some bookstores that could accommodate that. Um, I think Stories Cafe in LA often has music events with music. Um, yeah. Their space is outdoors, actually. Um, it's cool. Well, I'm, I'm not in LA. I'm in Sacramento. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. But anyway, um, um, you know, maybe I could chat with you a little bit more about yeah. that at a later time. I did have this one thing that I wanted to share. Yeah. Um, the, it wasn't my idea, but someone told me about it. And, and again, I don't exactly know the logistics, but it was basically having students act out a scene from your book. Mm. And there is one really cool scene in my book that I think would very much lend itself to that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, could have like the clothing of the era and the music of the era going on in, you know, while this scene is taking place. So I just wanted to share that as something that other people might want to think about. Yeah, that sounds um, so cool. And then my last thing was, uh, I was struck by what you said about the book trailer, because I know people do them, but I have absolutely no idea how mm -hmm. you go about that. Yeah. Uh, Neither do I really, um, but I think that it is. So actually one of my interns put together a book trailer for one of our books um, and she used exclusively like license free clips and sounds and music. Um, and so it's possible to, to kind of get that done without having a professional film crew or, you know, shoot it. Um, so I think that if you wanted to do it yourself, you could, you know, it's it's all just about using 
there's definitely free tools out there because we don't, we at Red Hat didn't have any paid software to edit videos together. Um, yeah. And we didn't pay to purchase any video clips or music or anything like that. So it's something that's definitely um, learnable, but if you didn't want to do it yourself, other, you know, other mm -hmm. people might be able to do it. Um, but yeah, book okay. trailers are, are so fun and they're, you know, they can be yeah. as simple as just you reading a passage over some clips or something like that um, right. of, of footage, but uh or it could be like if you if you end up doing that, um, having students act out that scene, that could also be double as a book trailer if you recorded that. Um, right. But yeah, that's yeah. Book trailers are are a really fun way to kind of get interest for your book. Okay. Congratulations thank you. on your book. Yeah, I hope. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> Want to drop drop the title of it? And I, I yeah, would love it's called it. it's called Our Song: A Memoir of Love and Race. And um, my my author's name is Linda Smith Hogan. Linda with a Y, Hogan with two Gs. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Absolutely. No, it sounds like a really beautiful book, and I would love to read it. So, um, congratulations again. That's an exciting endeavor, uh, and thank, thank you so much you. for sharing. Um, yeah, and you're, I'm absolutely happy to kind of chat with you one-on-one -on -one about more ideas uh, okay. that you might have. Um, okay, anybody else? We have about seven minutes left. So we can either do one more person sharing or, and, or like one question, like brief question Q&A. Um, yeah, Lisa. Uh, I just wanna say, I appreciate your time being with us writers in the community today and giving us a guiding hand along the way. We really appreciate you. Oh, uh, I you. very much appreciate you, yeah. Um, I started a novel that was recognized by Writer's Digest um, twice, which I, um, I, I started my first memoir uh, 14 years ago. Oh, wow. And then after my fiance was brutally murdered in one of Florida's more gruesome homicides, I started on my second one. And that one was shared at, it, our excerpts from that manuscript was shared at a Florida reading conference in 2012. And so I just continued. It was just very inspirational that people cared about the story and cared about my my love story with him and who he was as a person because a lot of times these victims of homicide in their families like mine and um and just uh you know other people who I've I've you know reached out to and who've reached out to me from the big media explosion mm -hmm. after his homicide um they're looking for inspiration they're looking for a reason and hope Yes. that that their loved one is still uh, around or you know wanting to wanting some kind of justice because the justice system often fails us and there were five mm -hmm. people in his murder yeah uh, his killing his killers it's still hard to talk about i'm so sorry um me too thank you so i continued writing continued writing i finished the book um and i yeah, I wrote my query. I, I have my synopsis almost finished and I, I've chosen not to just market everything myself. I, I am seeking, I have an acting literary agent, basically someone who uh, in the academic community, big in the academic community, who doesn't know much about the commercial world, mm -hmm. but just sees the value of the story and is kind of uh, being my guidance until I get uh, a literary agent to take this and then take it to the next step. Mm -hmm. um the next level do you have any do you have any any advice for someone like myself who has this very powerful message that you know it seems that I I have everything in place I, I guess I'm just wondering what the next step looks like mm -hmm. um in this process yeah it definitely looks like you are on the right track um if you are seeking out a literary agent, it's it's all about just finding the right one. Um, and again, 
PW.org has a great list of literary like agencies around the country and I think even around the world. Um, so it's a matter of just finding the right one, making sure that they respect you and your story um, and remembering that the literary agent works for you. Um, and so if they, if they, if it feels like they're not working in your best interest and that's not a relationship that you should, you know, continue or pursue. Um, but if, yeah, if you wanted to pursue a literary agent, a literary agent's the only thing that really will help you get uh, seen by the larger publishers. So the ones like in New York. Um, so I think that right now you can think about is obviously finding a literary agent is a great way to get you to the next level. Um, if you feel like it might take a long time or um, if you want to get your story out there sooner, there are many small presses that accept manuscripts without literary agents. And so if that's, a, if that's an avenue that you wanted to pursue, that's also something that you can start looking into. Um, if you're okay with having your story published by a smaller press. Um, so right now, I think it's mostly just about you taking the time to think about what it is that you really envision for this book. Um, are you concerned with getting it out there quickly? I say quickly, because even with a small press, it usually takes about two years for a book to come out after acceptance. So there's still a little bit of a process there. Um, but is this something that you want to kind of have more control over and have more of a hand in it? Um, or do you want to hand it to a literary agent and have them kind of handle the rest of it? Um, yeah, so it's, it's mostly at this point, it seems like you just have to uh, spend some time figuring out which avenue to go in. And there's no, it's not like you have to pick one and you can't do the other. Uh, it's just uh, what avenue do you want to spend the most time kind of going into right now? Um, it sounds like an incredible book. I definitely want, it sounds like something that needs to reach as many people as possible. So if that's, um, that's something to consider as you continue your, your journey and your process. Um, I can talk a little bit about, I'm almost running out of time actually. Uh, so I can't really talk much about um, the differences between small publishers or, or larger ones, but if you wanted and, sorry. We can go a little bit over. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm just gonna go quickly through. Um, publicity is a lot of work, can be fun. Okay, that's usually worth it. Mm -hmm. And then I just wanted to uh, get here to my contact information. So um, if anybody wants to continue this conversation um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis so that we can kind of talk more personally about your work and your journey, feel free to feel email free to me. Email me. Um, at media at redhand.org. Uh, you can also, you know, find more information about Red Hen at redhand.org. Um, but yeah, it seems like, uh, Lisa, I would love to talk with you more one-on-one -on -one if you wanted to. Um, I would love that. Yeah, but it sounds like an incredible project and um, I definitely wish you the best of luck. It seems like you've got everything kind of, you're on the right track with the queries and, um, and you're doing everything that I would have advised anyway, so. <laughs> All right, we are, um, oh, I was gonna discuss the, very quickly, the differences between small presses and larger presses. Um, so the, the big five might become the big four. I don't know what's happening with that. Um, larger presses in New York obviously have huge distribution power. Um, they have the huge budget. Uh, the cons are um, they can they only take uh, manuscripts that are submitted by agents, so you have to have a literary agent if you want to be considered. Um, and then it's also just the involvement of the publisher. So larger publishers have less of a hand, or they give you a little bit less of a hand in kind of the journey of the book, um, unless it's unless they think it's going to sell, you know. A million copies or whatever. Um, for the most part, they work on your book and they publicize it for about three months, maybe, and then they move on to the next books because they just have so many. 
um, a small press, I can speak for Red Hen at least, we work on your book. We work on, we start working on publicity one year before the book comes out and we continue working on it for the next year after it comes out. And then even then we still kind of keep it on our festival lists and on our, you know, reading recommended and we put it in our catalog and stuff like that. And it's available all the time. So a small press has the ability to be with you for longer and be with you every step of the way. Um, we are, we at Red Hand are super active in, in whole, like it's a partnership between the author and the publisher. So the author actually does need to do quite a lot. And this is all the advice that I gave you. Uh, today, everything that I just shared with you all is stuff that we encourage our authors to do. And so sometimes authors are like, oh, I don't want to do all of that stuff. Like, I thought that you were going to handle everything, or I thought that you would just like publish it and then I'm just going to, you know, sit back and relax. And, you know, sometimes that happens. The problem is it doesn't sell a lot of copies. Um, again, I can only take the book so far. Uh, the, the magic in creating that space with the book and selling tons of copies really relies on how much effort the author puts in. Um, and, you know, the more effort the author puts in, the more effort that I put in, um, I match them, you know, and Chris Samiris Young, who I had shown uh, earlier, was, I think before the pandemic, it was so unfortunate because she had set up 70 events, I think. Her book came out in 2020, in April of 2020. And so she had to pivot all of those events to either virtual events or uh, or postpone them. Um, but she worked her, her butt off and she was in communication with me a solid six months before the book came out. And was, you know, I think we had like monthly meetings just to keep each other updated. And so it was, she worked hard and it worked. Um, and so the difference, kind of circling it back, the difference between a small press and a larger press is that a, a smaller press is way more invested in kind of you, your work, and making sure that you have all the tools you need and are happy with what we're doing and are excited about the book and are you know also working to publicize the book. Um, a larger publisher has less time to be able to hold your hand and you know, be transparent about everything they're doing and they work on your book for a little bit less time than, um, than a small press would. So as you're considering kind of publishing your work, if you have a full length manuscript and you want to get that done, um, that's also something to consider. And yeah, Linda, actually, before we go, I want to wrap this up really quickly, but uh, where did you get your book published? Um, it's published by um, an indie hybrid uh, publisher okay. called She Writes Press. Oh, great. I've heard of She Writes. They only yeah. publish women. All of their staff are women. They want to tell women's stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, another small press. So, um, yeah. So, that, and, and obviously small presses are, are much easier to be seen. Um, because they, you know, in terms of having your manuscript actually considered. Um, so, yeah, but uh, I think I'm gonna try and wrap it up now. It has been amazing with you all. Thank you guys so much for being with me. I wasn't sure what to expect. Um, I'd never done one of these specifically about marketing and publicity before. So I was very nervous, um, but I'm glad that it seems like it was useful for you all. Um, again, please feel free to email me if you have any other questions. Um, and I really would love to like, this is an unexpected perk of my job and being hired at Red Hen was being able to share what I've learned with others and, and help them on their journeys as well. And so it's, it's my favorite thing about this job. So um, please, please do get in touch with me and I would love to talk with you more. Um, but thank you all so much and enjoy the rest of Culturama. Thank you. Thank you for sharing everything that you, uh, everything that you've learned on, on the job. Um, also, uh, just while I have everybody, while I have most of you still here, um, I wanna say how proud I am of Monica because she is a former student of mine. 
um, how how awesome she's doing and how well she's doing, and that we could I could give you the opportunity to to share with us at Culturama, um, which I will always do as long as I'm in charge. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Susan has a question asking how to access the recording. Uh, let me. Uh, we have a Culturama blog. Um, if you just type into Google, I don't have the website memorized right now. Uh, just type Culturama blog uh, into Google uh, and it should be one of the first things that pops up. Uh, give us a couple of days because it takes a little bit of turnaround to get everything uh, uploaded. Uh, but all the workshops that we're recording this weekend will be posted hopefully within the next week. Um, Hopefully you can you can join us for some some really great uh, creative writing workshops tomorrow. I know Andrew uh, Andrew Turner who's with us right now uh, is teaching a really great one, um, and we also have uh, later today uh, at three o'clock uh, an animal drawing workshop that sounds really really cool and really really interesting. So um, whatever you do, I hope you enjoy the rest of your time at Culturama, uh, and I hope to see you this weekend and or next weekend. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank again. you. Have a great day. Hi, hey, everybody. Thank you, Monica, for answering all my weird questions. Oh, thanks, Andrew, for coming. I didn't think you'd be here. Um, yeah, no, it was fun. It was really great. And thank you, Lloyd, uh, for this opportunity. It's always amazing to get to come back to Culturama. So. Uh, you know, even just for the chance to see you, because I know I don't get to see you. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I, miss our, I miss our writing group. I know, so do I. Uh, speaking um, of, Michelle wanted to get that going again. Yeah, no, Did I need I to. Have... Well, I'd stop the recording. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I need to talk to her.